and original. From Story Studio Network, I'm Aaron Trafford. I'm Dave Trafford, and welcome to this episode of Canadian Forestry Can Save the World. This is the podcast series where we explore the role the forestry industry can play in fighting climate change. And in this episode, we want to turn innovative thinking around. So far in this series, we've come to the conclusion that innovation isn't so much about the product or a technology or a service. It has to do with how we think about solutions to problems. In most cases, it's the thinking that's new. The innovation is in the approach to what may actually be an old problem. Yeah, and we've seen all kinds of examples of that in the course of the conversations and the research we've done for the show. It's pretty much been the entire foundation for this new season of the podcast. And what we've been learning is the forestry sector is on the leading edge of innovation. And that new thinking in our approach to everything from how our forests are managed to how we use wood product to help us transition away from the use of fossil fuels. Yeah, and the new thinking, the the new approaches, the new lens, whatever we call it, the new angles, bringing new clarity, new solutions to these old and long-standing problems. But in this episode, we're going to turn that lens around and we'll see how old wisdom is now being embraced as new thinking. So in episode two of this season, we talked about wildfires and forest fires. We talked about the obvious safety concerns and the dangers posed by wildfires. And the 2023 fires were, in fact, the worst we've seen in Canada. Absolutely astonishing. We saw over 18 million hectares burned, which is roughly 5% of all the forested area in Canada. We heard from Kari Stewart-Smith at Canfor. She told us the 2023 fires destroyed about 5% of our forests in Canada. And we also heard that fires are a necessary part of that ecosystem that supports a healthy, resilient forest. In fact, Kari says there are times, get ready, there are times when it makes sense to set fires on purpose. Prescribed burns, they're part of of the modern forest management toolkit, but they are rooted in old wisdom. Indigenous nations often used fire in many places, and they would set fires that were fairly small and of low severity in order to clear the underbrush and the smaller trees away and create better habitat for plants and animals. Those controlled prescribed burns not only pruned or thinned the forest, they helped clean up the dead wood and all that windfall that would have been tinder for more intense, more dangerous wildfires. And the modern science makes it clear that fires in the forest can be good for the soil because they also help regenerate a healthier forest. And that adds to biodiversity, which is important. And we learned those controlled burns can even create things called natural fire barriers in the forest. Kind of like a way of mitigating any future damage that could come from future forest fires. Yeah, and all of it is part of the 21st century approach to fire prevention, to fire management, to forest management. But, and I underscore this, caps locks and put it in bold, it's thinking that's centuries old. Meet Tina Rasmussen. My name is Tina Rasmussen. I'm the Chief Business Officer for MLTC Industrial Investments. Now, Tina is part of the leadership team at MLTC Industrial Investments in Saskatchewan. Meadow Lake Tribal Council. She says the teachings of the Indigenous elders informs their business at the Meadow Lake Tribal Council. We're not the owners of this world. We're only here for a very brief time. And our elders tell us we should always leave it better than the way we found it. Yeah, the traditional teachings tell us to leave our world better than we found it. And that, in part, has formed the business model for MLTC Industrial Investments. The Meadow Lake Tribal Council, many years ago, over 40 years ago, purchased North Sass Forest products. It was back in the 80s. 
when the council elders decided to buy a sawmill facility that was operating on their traditional lands. Along with that, the government had an, a forest allocation that that um, belonged to to that mill. Um, so we inherited that. So that would be a license associated with that with the timber, facility. yeah, with that yeah. particular okay. facility, yeah, uh, just for timber harvesting, right? Mm-hmm. So it didn't come because we were the Meadow Lake Tribal Council. It didn't come because we were nine nations. It came because of the facility. And when nine First Nations came together to make that Meadow Lakes Tribal Council purchase of the mill, well, they were granted a license that allowed them to cut timber in the region. Now, it's important to know, the license was granted because they owned the mill. It had nothing to do with their indigenous status or their place on the land. Owning the mill meant they could harvest the timber that would then be processed at the mill they owned. And that in and of itself is good for business, insofar as the council had control over that resource and then the mill. But... Our leaders back in at that time knew that that would give them the forest tenure, and if they had control over the forest tenure, plus they had purchased the industry that 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 those logs were going to end up at, they could control many many other things. It's interesting to see how the Meadow Lake Tribal Council's ownership of the mill reframes their relationship with the forest on their traditional lands. Push ahead forty years, and now the Meadow Lake Tribal Council through its corporation, its, its partnership with Paper Excellence, that corporation was able to have direct influence over the way things look now in our traditional territory. The council not only has more control over the resource in the territory, their forestry operations today are an economic juggernaut. I mean, it directly benefits Indigenous communities right across Saskatchewan. They're doing a hundred plus million dollars a year. They've got, I don't, I don't know how many megawatts of, of renewable energy they're putting on through their biofuel. They're supplying, you know, huge opportunities in the province of Saskatchewan, and it is multiple First Nation led. J.P. Gladue is among Canada's Indigenous business leaders that praise the MLTC model. My name is J.P. Gladu. My Indigenous name, spirit name is Mokwate, which means bear heart. J.P. joined us in the previous season of this podcast. And you'll recall he's the former president and CEO of the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. And he's also the principal at Mokwate. I'm the principal of Mokwate, uh, my consulting firm with a great bunch of people. And the name of his firm only reinforces this notion of the deep historic and cultural relationship the Indigenous people have with the environment, with our forests, the lakes, the waterways, and the wildlife they support. Makwate means bare heart. That relationship is at the heart of his business. His firm works with First Nations, with governments and non-Indigenous companies in the resource sector. We consider ourselves a, a bridging consultancy. Mokwate facilitates the commercial and business developments being done with First Nations communities right across Canada. How they can intersect in a progressive way, in a way that is going to benefit not only their company, but the communities and the people that they work with. And so we help them put together strategies and opportunities to engage in a meaningful way. So now we're talking about bringing the Indigenous ethic to the table when First Nations business intersects with government and non-Indigenous corporations. Yeah, it's a subtle but powerful point. And as well-intended as the policymakers may be at all levels of government, government regulation can get in the way of business development for First Nations. I find that governments typically, when it comes to the Indigenous relationship, they really don't do a very good job, generally speaking, in creating the, 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 the business space because they're not business people. Sure, government isn't in the business of doing business, but the government does have an important role in establishing guardrails around the way business is done. You and I don't expect the government to make these business decisions, but we certainly do expect the corporations that operate in our backyards and our territories to make good business decisions. And the policies help shape that. 
So JP's mission is to navigate the space between First Nations, government, and corporate Canada. And that ultimately puts the Indigenous people's relationship with the environment at the center of these business development discussions and plans. That relationship isn't just a way of doing business. It's a way of life now that informs the business. We come from a perspective that the environment is such an influence to you, whereas, you know, the settler society more brought to us individualism. And uh, we just kind of have always had a, a cultural clash over that relationship. It was one of the first things to come up when I talked to Jacob Taylor. I am Jacob Taylor, and I'm a band member of Curve Lake First Nation. He's a member of the Curve Lake First Nation near Peterborough, Ontario. Hey, I know Curve Lake. Yes, yes, you do. (laughs) It's right where Shabong and Buckhorn Lakes meet. And uh, now Jacob was in Calgary when we connected, but we did have a good chat about the comings and goings on Shabong and Buckhorn. So what does he do in Calgary? In addition to being a band member of Curve Lake, I'm also the CEO of Indigenous Aerospace. He runs a company that uses drones in a variety of ways to support the forestry operations right across the country. His drones help monitor forest fires and they can be equipped with LIDAR, the kind of technology we told you about earlier in the series that's used to help map the forest. We're a First Nation owned and operated drone company that works to build capacity using remote piloted aircraft systems on behalf of First Nation communities or in tandem with First Nation communities. Yeah, it's another great example of a First Nations owned and operated company that's supporting the forestry industry. And that, in and of itself, is a good news story. But as Tina pointed out, most of Canada's Indigenous communities are typically located close to or in the middle of the forest. So doing a thriving business to ensure a thriving forest only underlines the unique lens they bring to the forestry sector. So let's dial back to the matter of innovation, of new thinking and approaches applied to solve problems or break down barriers. We said we're going to make you consider innovation through a new lens. New thinking informed by old wisdom about new thinking. So innovation informed by old wisdom about in- innovation? I I think so. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> All right, well, l- let's recap quickly. Tina tells us the elders at MLTC teach us to leave the world better than we found it. Jacob says Indigenous people are one with the natural environment. And that relationship frames and guides a way of life and, indeed, a way of doing business to the point where J.P. Gladue's consulting firm shares his spirit name, Makwate, which means bear spirit. And that historic relationship with the environment, with the planet, is at the heart of the traditional Indigenous approach to managing the forest. I mean, we've already talked about the use of the prescribed controlled burns in the forest. And that approach is based on centuries of observing the way the forest evolves and responds to varying climates and weather conditions. In fact, those observations look back seven generations and then apply that experience to look forward seven generations. And that traditionally guides the Indigenous plan, if you will, to managing the forest and the environment writ large. I think with Indigenous people, we put the environmental piece first. You know, we have to make sure we're responsible. We're the caretakers of Mother Earth. We're responsible for it. I want to make sure that my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren and their grandchildren that seven generations you're talking about, still has a pristine environment to do traditional activity on. So yeah, that foundational focus on and attention to the environment is at the heart of the First Nation and Indigenous businesses we've been talking about. But as you may recall, environment is the E in ESG, environment, social, and governance. ESG practices are a way of evaluating a company's environmental and social impact. Now we're moving into an era of uh, the new tag words, the ESG. 
right? Yeah. We look at the environment, the social and the governance. And as a business, as an industry, we need to be responsible and responsive to those particular pieces. ESG expresses a company's health, its stability, well beyond the bottom line on a balance sheet. The return on investment takes on a whole new meaning when we consider ESG. In fact, the ROI increases when a company's ESG score is high. Right. So let's follow that line of thinking just for a second. ESG has become this buzzword on Bay Street. Industry and corporate Canada, though, they're not just paying lip service here. They're making real commitments that have either have a positive environmental and social impact or they reduce any negative impact. Kind of six of one, half dozen of the other. Yeah, but, but either way, I mean, they're putting their money behind it because, as we heard earlier in the series, consumers and stakeholders and shareholders, they all expect companies to do right by the environment and by society. ESG is a very good way to describe all industry and government's responsibility towards development. They should always be looking at with that kind of lens. Have I moved into a territory? Am I protecting that territory? Am I leaving the territory and the people in it better off than when I got there? We talked about it in terms of added value, and that applies when companies are working on developments in First Nations communities. Right. So here's the new thinking about new thinking that is informed by old wisdom, if I got that in the right order. By any other measure. The traditional indigenous ethic and approach to forest management and business writ large is the model for ESG metrics and commitments. Absolutely. Because, I mean, when you make any decision, whether you're indigenous or non-indigenous, it has to be based on those things. ESG, the new thinking about corporate responsibility that is really an adoption of the traditional wisdom and teachings of the Indigenous communities. Yeah, that new thinking informed by old wisdom. But here's the cool twist for me. There's a call to add another element to ESG to round out the full impact, particularly in Indigenous territories. You know, and many, many Indigenous communities say there should be an IESG. You know, indigenous should be added to that because most natural resources, you know, when you start talking uranium, forestry, most times the indigenous people are the ones that are, that are right smack dab. That's their traditional homelands. I-E-S-G, indigenous environment, social and governance. Now that's new thinking. And here's something to consider. Okay, way before we ever heard about or talked about ESG or how it's reflected in traditional indigenous approaches to life and business. There was a time about 20 years ago when the large companies involved in the forestry business, particularly in northern Ontario, took a downturn and it was grim. It meant lost jobs or the threat of lost jobs. And J.P. Gladue says given the location, that meant a lot of Indigenous workers losing their jobs. Now, here's the interesting part. By accident or design, however it worked out, it was decided that First Nations communities would take a greater role in running these forestry operations. And it's universally acknowledged they've never been run better. Thank you for bringing that up because it's a brilliant example of I mean, it's happenstance. Uh, it was industry pulling out and who's going to fill the void. Exactly what happened here in my backyard. Um, I was part of the negotiating team in 2008. Three, uh, sorry, four of our First Nations at the table and one of the big industry partners were pulling out. And what were we, what were we going to do with the forest? Advanced here to 2023, going into 2024, our First Nations manage and control 100% of the forest. And our communities over that time, we went through our ups and downs, 
but our it can be debated but our communities are doing a better job of managing this force than ever before under our stewardship and our care and control we've got an amazing relationship with domptar as an example uh, we our communities have our own harvesting companies my first nation we have a sawmill and we're providing about a truck a day in lumber to the region and building our own homes we're looking at biogasification projects to put uh, carbon neutral fuel onto the system. And as an example, one of our mining proponents, Rock Tech Lithium, they want to establish, a, they're very close to a final investment decision. We hope it's positive. And, uh, you know, our communities, they actually go through my our community's reserve. And because they go through the Lake Nipigon Forest uh, Management um, Unit, our communities are the ones that are approving their road permits and their river creek crossing. So we're giving them a lot more certainty because we're partners with them. And I think that the, the, the forest and the ecosystem is better managed for uh, social as well as um, uh, industrial or commercial activities than ever before. So we've talked a lot about the environmental part of ESG. But the social and governance elements have a particular resonance when we consider them against the backdrop of the history of Indigenous people in Canada. The emergence of successful forestry operations that are owned and operated by First Nations and Indigenous communities put voices like Tina Rasmussen, J.P. Gladu, and Jacob Taylor at the table. Yeah, and the effect of that can't be understated. When you're in an equity position, it's entirely different because... You sit at the table. They've got to answer to you. You have a say over who gets hired, who gets fired, what contractors make it, which contractors don't make it. Tina will tell you that being heard is not just good for business, not just good for the economy of a community. It's actually at the heart of truth and reconciliation in this country. From the First Nations perspective, they just want to be part of the economy. And to be honest, it's easy for non-Indigenous Canadians to just completely miss that crucial connection. I think it's a huge thing because um, the whole idea behind truth and reconciliation is Indigenous people being able to be part of the rest of the world. It's really important that we be involved in this and, you know, other aspects to uh, the forest, like uh, I think the language of today is the bioeconomy. So there is a learning opportunity here. There is a reconciliation opportunity here. But where do they happen? Such a great question, Dave, and there's multi there's multi ways you can get at it, but I, I've always been a proponent. When you think about learning, it's mutual learning, right? We've We've got things to learn from each other, but it's all about making the space for those learn for those learnings to happen, but also an opportunity to share. So when we think about Indigenous people, you know, we're five percent of the population, with eighty percent of the biospheres in our backyards. We have knowledge, and we want to bring that to the table. And you can't necessarily integrate that Western knowledge and the indigenous way of knowing into the same mechanics because they're two different worldviews. But what you can do is create space for both the Western science knowledge systems and the indigenous knowledge holders to be in the same room to share data, to share stories, to share learnings for stronger outcomes and, and do it equally. It's not one system's better than the other in my mind. They both have their complementary uh, opportunities to contribute to something that is going to strengthen our environment and, and our, our well-being. Recall what Tina said about the teachings she learned from the elders in her community. Leave the world better than you found it. The lesson from the elders are based on looking back seven generations and seven generations forward. And J.P. Gladu is optimistic when he looks ahead. You know, Indigenous people, we're 5% of the population. We're, I think, about 3.2% of us are of working age. age. You know, colonialism has certainly had its impact on our people. Um, I don't know how many of us uh, have, um, you know, mental health uh, to go to work every day. Um, but we've certainly been impacted. Um, we need our allies, Dave. 
um, folks like you that uh, open up the conversation with folks like me um, to help us along. Um, and I also tell you that it, I'm really encouraged and I see some incredible Indigenous young people in their late 20s and 30s who are really coming to the forefront. And I, you know, as I kind of go in my last five to 10 years, 10, you know, 10, 15 years, I hope at least, where I'll remain relevant. But I, <laughs> but you know, um, I'm really hopeful this next wave of, of Indigenous leaders are going to contribute in a way that we haven't seen yet. And it's, I'm hopeful for that. We appreciate the time you've spent listening to this show. So please pass along your comments and any questions you may have and leave us a rating wherever you're listening to the podcast. For our producers, Becky Coles and Jen Hudson, our technical producer and audio editor, Mike Trutler, for Aaron and the whole team at Story Studio Network, I'm Dave Trafford. Thanks for listening. This podcast series is produced for Forestry for the Future. And for more information, I'd encourage you to visit the website forestryforthefuture.ca. And you may want to get involved in supporting a sector that's committed to growing a greener economy and driving our country towards a net zero carbon future for you and your kids. I'm Dave Trafford, and Canadian Forestry Can Save the World is produced by Story Studio Network. This is SSN.